Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome to Rhodes. My name is Omer Rain. I'm the uh, vice president of the Muslim Students Association here on campus. Uh, this lecture is the first part of a week of events put on by the MSA. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have a hijabi for a day, and signups for that are going to be right outside after this lecture. On Wednesday, we're going to have a Myths and Mysteries of Islam lunch at noon in Hyde Hall in the Rat. And on Thursday, we have a visit to the mosque, um, to the Memphis Islamic Center. We'll be leaving campus at 6.30 and hopefully returning by 8.30, so if you're interested in that. And that's it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Musi, a member of the Department of Religious Studies here at Rhodes. I'm pleased to welcome you tonight to Communities in Conversation, a year-long series that brings key thinkers to Rhodes College to help us reflect on major questions and issues that face our world today. Tonight's installment of this series, entitled A New Vision of Islam in America, is sponsored by the Rhodes Department of International Studies, the Department of Religious Studies, the Search Program, the Rhodes Lecture Board, and the Spence Wilson Chair in Humanities. I'd like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation to the individuals associated with these divisions in the college for their assistance in making this occasion possible. I also want to acknowledge my gratitude to the Rhodes Interfaith Team, the Muslim Students Association, and especially to Professor Jonathan Judaikin for their invaluable help. Our speaker for this evening is Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf. Imam Rauf comes to us as a leading Islamic thinker engaged in issues of interfaith dialogue and as a proponent of forging connections of mutual trust and support among moderates of all traditions. He is the founder and chair of the Cordoba Initiative, a multinational, multi-faith organization dedicated to providing innovative solutions to areas where conflict between Islamic and Western communities undermine local and global security. In addition, Imam Rauf currently serves as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Islamic Center of New York an advisor to the Interfaith Center of New York, and as a member of the World Economic Forum. In 1997, he co-founded the American Society for Muslim Advancement, the first Islamic organization committed to building bridges between Muslims and the American public by elevating the discourse about Islam through educational outreach, interfaith collaboration, culture, and arts. Imam Rauf is author of several books, including Islam, A Search for Meaning, and What's Right with Islam is What's Right with America. His latest book, entitled Moving the Mountain, will be available for purchase after tonight's talk. His writings have also been published in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Foreign Policy, and the Daily Beast. He has been a frequent guest on programs such as The O'Reilly Factor, 60 Minutes, and Fresh Air with Terry Gross. He's been the recipient of Huffington Post Game Changer Award and the annual Alliance Peace Builder Award. In 2011, Time Magazine named him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And he was listed by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top 100 global thinkers of 2010. Would you please join me in welcoming Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Musi, for that wonderful introduction. 
I hope I merit and earn it tonight. It is customary for Muslims to begin, as we always do, by invoking the name of our God, the Creator, the Creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, the God of Adam, the God of Noah, of all the prophets, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus Christ, the God of Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon all of these noble prophets. I'd like to begin by talking about my story. I was born in Kuwait of Egyptian parents. When I was 18 months, my father was transferred to England. And for more than four years, I grew up in, um, in Tunbridge Wells and in Cambridge, for those of you who know England. When I was six, my father was then transferred to Malaysia, which was at that time still a British colony. And I grew up for almost 10 years in Malaysia. At the age of 16, I finishing high school, I returned to Cairo for a year. And then my father was transferred in 1965 to New York, where he worked for five years in New York and 10 years in Washington, DC. During this period of time as growing up, I remember in England being asked, Faisal, what do you want to be when you grow up? And like every five-year-old in England, I wanted to be the proverbial engine driver. And after about a couple of years, I thought I wanted to be an actor, and then a musician, and then a film director, and then a scientist. By the time I was 14, 15, I was in high school studying Hamlet. To be or not to be, that was the question. Then I realized that the question that they were asking me was the wrong question. They weren't asking me, what did you want to be? They were asking me, what do you want to do? And I realized I could do different things and I was interested in different things, but it made the question of who, who I wanted to be a more important question. At the same time, because I always felt myself foreign and alien to my environment, even when I went back to Egypt for holidays, my cousins would make fun of me and say, you're not a real Egyptian, you speak funny, you speak like a khawaga, as we say in Egypt, you, know, you speak like a, like a, a foreigner. So I never felt completely at home wherever I lived. I was always different, I was always alien. But this prompted me to really search for my own, my real identity. Who was I? What was I? What did it mean to be human? What was my purpose in life? And as I looked over my life, and we had albums at that time, you know, we real photos, not iPhone digital things that you have right now. And I could see that physically I changed. I didn't look the same as when I was an infant, when I was four, when I was six, when I was 10. My physical appearance changed. So were my emotional attachments. I just told you how many different things I wanted to do or to be. My professional ambitions shifted and changed every few years. And my emotions, when I was six years old, I had a crush on my teacher in first grade. I felt jilted when she got married. I was so upset with her. <laughs> and every couple of years, every year or two, I'd have a crush on another girl. But what that taught me was that, well, if everything about me changed, my emotions changed, my ambition or my work changed, my physiology changed, then I asked myself this question, why do I still insist that I am the same person? Why do I still insist that I, with a capital I, am the same I? If everything that is measurable, everything that is observable about me is changing and has changed, what is it and where is that locus, that locus, the location of what I would call the timeless Faisal, the eternal me or the time, that part which doesn't change? And what is its nature? I share this journey because I'm sure many of you here are on a similar journey. 
on a similar quest. And being fortunately gifted, I was usually among the top 5% or 10% of my class, I wanted to know. This prompted me on my spiritual search. I gave a whole talk just about this portion, but let me run because we have more to discuss in tonight's lecture. But then I, my conclusion was that the timeless I, the timeless self, was not my body, was not my emotional self, not my intellectual self, but my spiritual self. That part of me which was my soul. And then the search for God, of course. I mean, you know, if God is real, how do I know God is real? Okay, my parents are Muslim. How do I know that what I'm doing is, is really authentic? I remember being taught when I was seven, eight, nine years old how to pray. When we pray, there's a section of our prayer at the end where we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, which means I bear witness that there is no God but God. Every time I would say that, I would, my heart would say, Faisal, you're a bloody hypocrite. You're mouthing these words, but you haven't seen God yet. You haven't borne witness to God. How could you even presume to say something so, so huge in import? I mean, to say I bear witness that there is no God but God, that's a huge statement to make. How could I be so presumptuous? as to make it without having actually experienced that reality. I'm sure many of you have had similar problems in your respective faith traditions. I remember asking my dad once over lunch. Lunch was the big meal of the day. We called it dinner, then supper was what we had at night. I said, dad, doesn't the word ashadu mean I witness? He says, yes, Faisal. Okay, Dad, doesn't Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah means I've seen that there is no God but God? He says, yes, Faisal. He said, Dad, I haven't seen God yet. I can't do my prayers sincerely. I hadn't read the Quran yet. I didn't know enough to know that God accuses in the Quran those who practice their faith without sincerity. Sincerity in faith is such an important thing. To be a mukhlas, mukhlas, you know, we have a chapter called the chapter of sincerity, which talks about the oneness of God. And if anything, I didn't want to be fake. And the worst kind of fake is to be a religious fake. I talk about this story in my book, but I share it with you because I believe this is a journey that almost all of us are on. At some time or other, we want to know, is this really, is this really God's words that I'm reading? If there is a God, how do I know that there is a God? And being an intellectual, I read books and religious philosophy and so forth, but I came to the conclusion that that couldn't take me. I was fortunate one of my dad's friends was a was a professor of Sufism, and he led me to read books by Imam al-Ghazali, who had actually, when he was 40 years old, a crisis of faith. And he wrote a, a, a biographical work on his own, uh, on his own spiritual journey. It's called Al-Nuqid al-Dalal, been translated by many Christian scholars. Uh, one of the translations is called Deliverance from Error. I was fortunate that I was vouchsafed what Christians call an act of divine grace. A moment which Sufis call a moment when you are given to taste the reality of God. And I'm sure many of you here have had such experiences where for what we call in America a long minute, one of those minutes which lasts like, you know, 20 minutes in your own perception, in slow motion. The only way I could describe it is that at that moment, the boundaries of myself dissolved. 
And at that time, I didn't know what LSD was, so you can't accuse me of having gone on one of those trips. When I came in the 60s, Timothy Leary visited Columbia University, where I went to school. And uh, so that was the time when many of my American um, similar generation uh, experimented with those things. Where, but for a moment, you might say, a long minute, the boundaries, if you imagine what would happen if the boundaries of yourself dissolved. And at that moment, you felt a oneness with the universe, with everything around you. And at that moment, you actually felt and knew that you're in the presence of God, in the presence of the Creator. And you could viscerally feel the magnitude of God, the immense power of God, the omniscience of God, that God knows everything, and the incredible compassion and mercy and love that God has towards his creation, including all of us. That was what I felt. And that moment I felt, aha, finally I have borne witness to God. That was a synopsis of my journey. It was important to me because I knew, I knew that with the intelligence I had, I could be a real SOB, as we say in America. <laughs> I could commit any crime and justify it like lawyers do in a courtroom. But I felt I had to conduct myself by a set of standards that were my own, that I fully subscribed to, that those were to be the anchor of who I was and what I was. And that was how I was going to answer the question of who I am, what kind of a person I wanted to be the nature of my being. And the nature of my being, as God defines it in our respective traditions, the Quran describes the creation of Adam, of human beings, as created from the earth. And God says to the angels, when I shall have completed his form and breathed into him of my own spirit, and fall in prostration to him. So from this verse, we learn that God defines us as drops of his soul. In Christianity and Judaism, the Bible, we are taught that God created Adam, or created humankind, in his image. Well, what, what, where is the image of God in us? It does not lie in our physiology. It lies fundamentally in our soul. It is there. You know, Rumi has a great story where he says, I went looking for God. I went looking for God in a sacred mosque in Mecca, the Kaaba. Didn't see him there. He went to the great temples. He couldn't find God there. He went to the tallest mountain where people meditate, couldn't find God there. And finally he said, I look into my own heart, and there I found him. So the discovery of God, the search for God, it's really the search for the moment, or the seeking of the moment, where God discloses himself in your consciousness. And once you know that your fundamental being is your soul, then you are concerned about your soul. As Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That's the one thing you not, none, none of us should do and none of you should aspire to. It's not worth it. Nothing is worth it. The salvation of the soul is what our, all our faith traditions speak about. That is what we must commit to. <clears throat> now I'll segue to the theme of my talk. Every religious tradition, every faith tradition, has one eternal challenge, a constant challenge. 
And the way I would describe it is as follows. What are the eternal principles of our faith? What are the timeless aspects of our religion? And how do we express it in a continually changing context? Now, in a sense, that was God's challenge as well. The story of religion from the Quranic point of view is that God sent prophets or messengers to every faith community to express God's truths in that language, in that context, in that societal context. And that is why God's laws, God himself modified his laws from context to context, from time to time. But within every religious tradition, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, even Islam, you'll find that as that religious tradition moved from one society to another, and as these, that faith community continued from one era to another, it tended to evolve. So if you look at Christianity, for example, Jesus Christ lived in what is today Palestine. But when Christianity went to Egypt, went to Syria, went to Greece, went to Russia, went to Rome, went to Europe, even the churches were named according to those countries. The Coptic Church in Egypt, the Syrian Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox. When the Romans finally succumbed, the Roman Catholic Church, the Dutch Reformed Church, the Anglican Church, and you have the American Baptist churches. Now, when that happens, something happens in the perception that people have towards that religion. Greeks do not think of Christianity as a Palestinian religion. They think of it as a Greek religion. The Italians today do not think of Christianity as a Palestinian religion. Think of it as a, an Italian religion. The Pope is in Rome for Christ's sake. <laughs> the Anglicans think of Christianity as an English religion. And the same thing with Muslims. When Islam spread from the Hejaz, from the West Arabia where the Prophet lived and died, to Egypt, and the Egyptians became Muslims. Egyptians think of it, Islam as an Egyptian religion. So do the Turks think of it as a Turkish religion. There was no Pakistan 80, 90 years ago. Pakistanis think of Islam as a Pakistani religion. When the Persians became Muslim, Iranians think of Islam as an Iranian religion. And how this happened was that the principles of Islam were expressed in the institutions of that society, in the laws of that society, in architectural forms of that society. So if you look at Islamic culture, Islamic the architecture of mosques, this is how the different schools of law developed in Islam. The jurists, the scholars, when they moved from one place to another, when Imam al-Shafi, for example, the founder of one of the schools, moved from Iraq to Egypt, his, his decisions, his legal decisions, his fatwa, as we call them, his fatwa, has changed. In fact, any student who studies Islamic law will read the, the Egyptian fatwas or the Iraqi fatwas of Imam al-Shafi. And the reason why different schools of law emerged is because of the fact that the, that the social conditions in those societies were different. <coughs> So we can speak kind of loosely, but not inaccurately, of an Egyptian Islam, a Turkish Islam, an Iranian Islam, a Yemeni Islam, an Indo-Pakistani Islam. Not that the creed is different. We pray the same way, we read the same Quran, recite the same Quran, everything. But the jurisprudence is different. The cultural norms may be different. The architectural forms of our mosques may differ from culture to culture. The music, the religious music, or religious songs that people sing, the Qawwali music which was developed in, in, in India is, has a uniquely Indian sound, but it is Islamic 
music. Not liturgical, but very much kind of spiritual music which people love to, in, to, to listen to and enjoy. And therefore, I believe that what we Muslims in America need to do today is to evolve ourselves from being immigrant Muslims in America who still look to our home countries and evolve what I call an American Islam. I don't mean that we will pray differently or we'll stop fasting Ramadan or that we'll start eating pork, nothing like that. We'll still abide by our rules and regulations, but culturally, the way we dress, we, as long as we abide by the, by, the, by the dress code, you know, you don't have to wear a sari or you have to wear kamis sharwal to be a Muslim, you don't have to wear a thawb, as long as you are dressed modestly, which is this, the theme of the dress code, you can dress modestly in very, a variety of different ways. And therefore, our mosques should look American. They should look timely, because when a culture expresses itself in the local vernacular of a society, then a religion is regarded as being local and no longer seen as being alien. That is the theme of my book, and I expand it in terms of many aspects of what I mean, in terms of laws, in terms of, in terms of relating our uh, jurisprudence to the foundational documents of the Constitution of America and the founding documents of our founding fathers, to show the similarity in how our, our nation was founded on principles that are fundamentally quite religious. Uh, so these are the things that I speak about, and I think, if you don't mind, I'll stop at this point and, uh, and open the floor to questions so it doesn't become just a monologue. So with that, I thank you very much, and God bless you all. So we've got students with uh, wireless microphones who'll be happy to uh, hand one to you. If you have a question, I see one right over here. Omer, right behind you there. Thank you. Lovely talk. Can you explain um, the difference between Shia, Sunni, and Sufism? Can you be Shia or Sufism? I'm leaving the mic. Do you understand the yes, question? Yes, I do. Yes. Um, All Muslims have, we, we pray the same way, we are Sunni or Shia. We have one Quran, the Quran is identical. The difference between Sunni and Shia has to do more with the uh, origin of a political schism which happened after the death of the Prophet. Because the Prophet was not only a Prophet, uh, by the end of his life, the last uh, 10 years of his life, a uh, few years of his life, he became effectively um, the leader, the political leader of, of the whole of, of Arabia. So you had a person who was not only the, had the, the mantles of prophet and spiritual teacher and master, but also head of state, chief justice, um, you know, uh, maybe the commander in chief. He, 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 he carried all those things. After his death, uh, within the f about 60 years, a schism developed as to whether the, the succession should lie from the bloodline of the Prophet through his son-in-law, Ali, who is also his cousin, married to his daughter, Fatima, through whom he had two grandsons, or whether anybody can be the leader of the community. Uh, and that was what led to the, those who believed that the, the political leader should be from the bloodline of, uh, of Ali, Prophet, Prophet's bloodline through Sayyidina Ali are called the Shia, which literally means the party, it was the short from the Shia to Ali, the, the party of Ali, and the Sunnis was the name that was given to those who felt that anybody could be the political leader. Uh, Shias are approximately 10-15% of the Muslim community around the world. Uh, the majority of them are in, in Iran is the majority Shia. Uh, there are Shia, significant Shia communities in the eastern part of the Arabian Peninsula uh, and, and also in Pakistan, Afghanistan, in that area. Um, 
Sufism refers to the spiritual path or the mystical path in, in Islam because you can practice your path, uh, what, what, what uh, religious writers call exoterically, the exot exoteric religiosity and esoteric uh, religiosity, which refers to the mystical path or the spiritual path, as it is called in different traditions, or the contemplative path. So Sufism refers to the contemplative path within Islam has been called tasawwuf in Arabic or Sufism in English. And you can be a Sufi whether you are a Sunni or, or a Shia. And uh, Sufis generally even open their doors to even non-Muslims who, who want to join. And, and, and basically, uh, in a group, we, we chant, repeat the names of God uh, and some formulas which, uh, which, which precipitate the kind of experience that I described so that you get to know uh, the they help you taste the reality of God. Uh, and then through the writings of people like a Rumi, or uh, you know, there are many other, Ibn Atta'illah's uh, aphorisms, there are many wonderful books. There's a huge body of literature that was written by Sufi writers that are just some of the most profound writings you'll ever read in your life. And I strongly recommend them to any one of, any one of you, to all of you for, for that matter. It's, it's great reading. Um, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Uh, uh, welcome, Imam, to Memphis. Uh, very you. nice presentation. My name is Nadeem Zafar. And the question for you is, in the aftermath of 9-11, the vision that you have talked about in your book and the vision that you talked about is Islam is a mainstream religion. It's now being pushed as a cult by Western interests or whatever. Now, in the end, the struggles you have gone through, would you expand on do you see the challenges of Muslim in this country increasing or decreasing or the support coming from the greater community? Is it more coherent now in support of Islam being part of an America as a mainstream religion or it's become more difficult? Well, you know, it's, it's, like, a, um, it's like playing a football game or a basketball game. You know, people score on each side and you can look at various waves and trends. But my conviction my conviction, uh, and also what I've observed, I've lived in this country now for 47 years, more than many of you here are old. Um, I, and from what I've read and studied about the, the experience of religious communities as they emigrate to this society, I'm very optimistic about the future. And let me tell you why. When I first came in the, the mid-60s, Islam was associated then primarily, was looked at primarily by the majority of, of, uh, of Americans through the lens of the black Muslim community that time. It was called the Nation of Islam. You know, you may have heard of Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali who were followers of, 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 his, of his group and his movement. And it, therefore, it was seen very differently. And I've seen how the major shift in how Islam is perceived by the majority of Americans. Let, let, me, let me show you another observation. Every, every 30, 35 years, a society changes. No society remains the same. Every 30, 35 years, a new generation is born, a generation dies, and the generation that is young becomes what I call the generation in power. So when you think of America, or England, or any country, we, people tend to think of it as static. The reality is that every day people are born, people are dying, and, uh, and people who are young gradually becoming in taking positions of power. So if you take a snapshot of a country, and fast forward every 30, 35 years, you'll see a different generation moving in. And what happens is that the values of that younger generation when they become dominant, become the dominant values of a, of a society. And the prejudices that a particular generation has will die with them as they themselves pass on. And therefore, as you educate a young generation on the importance of certain values, they will then make those values take root in a given society. I've seen the Muslim community grow in numbers enormously over the last 47 years. 
I have noticed that the acceptance of Islam and Muslims has, has increased in many, many, many different venues. Um, the Fatiha was recited in the opening of Congress some years ago. These are things which were, would have been unthinkable 40, 50 years ago. The other part which makes me feel optimistic is that what Muslims are going through and have been going through is no different than what Catholics went through or what the Jewish community went through. You know, Catholics had their churches burned in America a century, 150 years ago. Jews, you know, were, were the victims of a vicious, uh, you know, anti-Semitism until maybe the Second World War. They were not allowed in certain professions, not allowed in certain clubs. So America has changed a lot. But the, 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 if you study how, what happened to the American Catholic community, because they too went through this, this same experience. When, when they immigrated from Poland or from Italy or from Ireland, you had the Irish Catholic churches, the Polish Catholic churches, and the Italian Catholic churches. And so did the Jews. You had the Hungarian synagogues, you had the German Jewish, synagogues, you had the Polish synagogues, and if you're a German Jew who wanted to marry a Polish girl, man, that was like considered worse than an interfaith marriage. But the second generation, the third generation, as they acculturated, then they wanted to define themselves not as German Jews or as Polish Jews, not as Irish Catholics or as Polish Catholics or as Italian Catholics, the intermarriage between them occurred. Then gradually, over a period of two, three generations, an American Catholic identity emerged. This was pushed also by the American Catholic bishops who brought about, you know, uh, uh, in 1965, the uh, Nostra Aetate, as it's called. Um, and, and so what we are going through today actually replicates the narrative of any faith community that immigrates to a particular country. And they suffered worse than we did. We don't have our mosques burned down the way they did. We, we, yes, we may be victims of Islamophobia at some, but when you compare it to what our predecessors went through as a result of the civil rights movement, as a result of what, the, the result of, of the, the expansion and the broadening of the American demographic to include Jews and, 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 and Catholics. So the Protestant ethic expanded to the Judeo-Christian ethic, because how else would you expand? The Protestant ethic didn't have space for Catholics and Jews. Now we need to expand to the Abrahamic ethic in America, which is what I propose in my previous book. So I, I feel, based upon this study of American history and what I have seen, I'm extremely bullish on, on the future. And these young men of the Muslim women of the Young Muslim Association, as they bond, I was just told by um, Bill and Claudia, I forgot their last name, who invited me for dinner yesterday. They were saying that uh, you know, their daughter and some Muslim girls in high school were like comparing the hijabs. How do you put this thing on? You know, I mean, the kind of conversations that Muslim girls and non-Muslim girls, and same thing with boys in this country, this is, these are the bonds that will create a new generation. And one more thing makes me optimistic also. There are 1.6 billion Muslims worldwide. Muslims are roughly, not quite, about 23, 24% of the global population. America has interests all over the world and especially in the Muslim world. We have geopolitical interests. We have military bases in the Muslim world. We have oil interests, we have economic interests, we have business interests. So if you look at it from a purely interest point of view, America needs to have good relationships with the Muslim world. And the American Muslim community, and one of the roles and importance of developing and evolving a robust and coherent identity as American Muslims is that American Muslims can and will and already have begun to play a role in mediating between America as a global superpower and the Muslim world. Because this exactly was what happened with the Catholics and the Jews. It was the American Jews 
who have actually reshaped global Jewry. American Jews were the ones who were helpful in creating the state of Israel. American Catholic bishops were the ones who convinced the Vatican to move away from their previously held conception of non-separation of church and state. The Catholic Church did not believe and subscribe to separation of church and state until 1965 in Vatican II. This was brought about by lobbying pressure from American Catholic bishops and the writings of people like John uh, Courtney Murray, a brilliant writer. I like to pretend that I'm a Muslim version of John Courtney Murray. <laughs> I recommend his writings to everybody, especially to Muslims, but even to Catholics and Christians and none others, because he, he tries, he, his writings are extremely cogent on, on, on being both, both a, a, a genuine, authentic Catholic and showing how the American system of government expresses those principles very well. So these are some of the reasons, the important reasons why I think uh, I, I'm very optimistic about the future. And thank you for that important question. Go ahead. I would just like to ask uh, the Bible makes certain claims about the historical nature of Jesus. Uh, and I believe that the Quran makes claims otherwise. I would like to know how you would reconcile that. I reconcile the, the Quranic? Yes, the different claims about the historicity of Jesus that you find in the New Testament versus the ones in the Quran. How do you reconcile those? Uh, the, the Quran believes in the, subscribes to the virgin birth of Jesus. We believe that Jesus did not have a father. We do believe that, um, that Jesus was a word, the word of God. The Quran actually says that, that he was a, 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 a word of God, al Maryam, that God cast into Mary. We do believe that Jesus Christ uh, is one of the, the greatest prophets and messengers who was, um, who is also, Sufis regard him as the, that prophet who came with the greatest degree, his signature was about spirituality. He taught people spirituality. What the Quran differs is the Quran says that he was not crucified, but it was made to appear to them that he was crucified. Um, so we believe that Christ was crucified in appearance, but not in reality. Uh, some writers who subscribe to, a, to an apocryphal, apocryphal gospel attributed to uh, Bartholomew, I believe, St. Bartholomew, believe that Judas Iscariot was the one who was transformed at the, at the uh, Garden of Gethsemane to resemble Jesus Christ. And he was the one who actually was, um, was captured and tried and crucified in the place of Jesus which from the point of view of that gospel explains why Peter rejected him three times. He says, I don't know this man, because he knew he was not the real Jesus. Uh, that is how Muslims reconcile the Quran with the narrative of the New Testament. However, having said that, I do not want to say this in a spirit of, of, uh, of um, trying to make negative of another faith tradition or rejecting a faith tradition because part of our teachings is that we must respect the, uh, the, the beliefs of another faith tradition. In fact, the Quran expressly forbids Muslims from cursing the gods of those who reject God because then they may curse God by, by, by mistake, by error, and we are responsible for that. So I say this in, a, in, in the full spirit of humility and love and respect for my fellow Christians. So you've talked about the adaptation that faith traditions go through when they come to a new uh, location. And I was wondering if you thought that in this evolutionary process through the adaptation of the Muslim faith to America, 
or um, whatever other communities might come after, if you think it's possible either in the US or globally as a whole to come to a community where we don't need to go through these types of negative responses to new ideas coming into a society that we've seen with Judaism and uh, the various denominations of Christianity in the US and other countries around the world. Is it possible to get beyond that to a society that just accepts that? I, I'm hopeful for that for one reason. Because there's something new about the era through which I have lived. And that is the era of very rapid globalization. You know, when I was growing up and you read National Geographic magazines and you see the people in China, people in Arabia and people in South America, we all dressed differently and, you know, moved about differently. But fast forward 50 years and everybody all over the world wears Nike shoes and wears the Rolex watches. I mean, we wear Timex pieces. I mean, it's amazing how much more similar the world looks today than it did 50, 60 years ago. And the, the, rapid, uh, the, the rapid transfer of information has, has irreversibly uh, changed the world, brought us much closer together, and crunched us together in many, many ways. Um, if we succeed in this crunching of uh, this whole world into an increasingly what Clinton calls a global village, successfully, I think there is hope for us to create what I might call a globalized Christianity, a globalized Islam, a globalized religiosity. And I think that is part of the need of the day to day. That part of the objective of, of interfaith understanding, and interfaith dialogue, and interfaith study, is not only to study the different religions that we have, but to understand the commonness the, 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 what is common to all of our religious traditions and to, be, to, to, to know that our, and to learn experientially that our different religions are like different languages. So whether you express your ideas in English or in Arabic or in Turkish or in Japanese or in Mandarin, you are still speaking about the same truths. So to develop a society, a global society, where we recognize the same truths of our respective faith traditions, of our various interpretations, and see them as different languages. And we have the basis of that in my own faith tradition. Uh, what happened in the beginning is that in, in, in the first two centuries of Islam, maybe three, four centuries, uh, a number of schools of jurisprudence developed. In the beginning, there was tensions between them, but they pretty much reached a point rather quickly that they recognize that all of these are equally valid. So whether you follow the Hanafi madhab, the Hanafi school of law, or whether you follow the Shafi'i or the, you know, the Hanbali, or even the Ja'fari school of law, which the Shias adopt, they're all equally valid. There's more than one way to be right. Uh, so if we are able to extend this idea that we can have different languages that speak and express the same truth, I think that will be a huge step uh, in, in developing what you allude to as some kind of a vision of what I would like to call a globalized at least acceptance and acknowledgement of the oneness, fundamental oneness of faith. And there are writers like, such as Schoen, S-C-H-U-O-N is his last name, who has written a number of books such as the, um, uh, there's one that talks about the underlying unity of religions, I forgot the exact title, but you'll find it. And, and there have been uh, spiritual writers who have written about this in very profound ways that could help us actually chart the, uh, the path towards that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, Imam. Uh, my question is, in your opinion, what is the greatest misconception that Westerners have concerning Islam? The greatest misconception that we are terrorists. Um, that we're trying to impose our values on you, is another misconception. That we want you all to, you know, follow Sharia law and become Muslims and uh, stuff like that. These are among the misconceptions that people have. 
Uh, and to dispel that myth, you should not only get to know Muslims, but visit Muslim countries. Go, go and see you know, Muslims living in Morocco, in Egypt, in Turkey, in, in Indonesia. And, uh, and that will dispel that myth rather quickly, I hope. Okay, good evening, uh, Imam. Good evening. I have, um, my question to you is, being here in Memphis and in Tennessee, we've been, this, uh, the city and the state has been in the news recently with respect to relation between the Muslim and the general community for the right and the wrong reasons, both, in, uh, over the course of the last year. Um, with that in mind, and with, uh, I would imagine you're also visiting several cities and sites around the country to promote your message of the expansion of, uh, of the, uh, the consciousness of American spirituality. Um, was there something that you, exp was there something that brought you specifically to Memphis or Tennessee other than the invitation of Rogue Withers? Was there something that interested you? Because we've been in the course on the matters of Islamic relations rather prominent uh, so I'm just wondering if you had any expectations about having come here specifically. Well, I was hoping to see Graceland. <laughs> um, I used to sing Elvis Presley songs as a child, you know. And, uh, um, Memphis is also a, uh, the name of an Egyptian city, a town. In Egypt. I come from Egypt. Uh, but, but the answer to your question is that I, I, I've actually, after 9-11, I, I was, um, we did an outreach to the 9-11 community. And there was this very lovely lady who was young, by my standards, anybody below 50 is young. Um, I think she must have been in her late 30s or so, who had lost her husband 9-11. And she uh, was telling me that she said, you know, Imam Faisal, you can't minister to my personal hurt. Or we have our own ministers and so forth. But... We need a national healing in America after 9-11, between America and Islam. And she said to me that if people actually get the chance to hear you speak, you will change hearts and minds. It's not something which can be conveyed in a sound bite on a TV program, but it's something that requires events like this to do. And uh, therefore I have, and my, one of my board members who invited me a few weeks to Chicago and had me speak in front of a group like this as well. Uh, wants me very much to do as much as I can of this, because this is what it's all about. It's about meeting people in person, about getting the sense of another human being, about feeling what you, whatever you feel from the sincerity or lack thereof of a speaker, of a person who comes to visit you. Um, and, and, um, and this is my mission. I, I knew when I came to America in 1965 that my mission would have to do with, with, with formulating Islam in an American context. And, um, you know, when, when you know this is the work that God wants you to do, uh, you, you get the, um, as Eileen asked me earlier, uh, the, the energy and, uh, that comes uh, from doing what you're destined to do. Because when you do what you are destined to do, um, as my, one of my Sufi teachers said, God supports you in it. God provides you all the help in, in doing it. And uh, I was invited by some lovely people. I spoke earlier at Calvary Church, and, and I've gotten to meet some very lovely, lovely people here in, in Memphis. And I hope this is not the, is the first time, but I hope not the last time. And I loved seeing the Mississippi, it reminded me of the Nile. <laughs> the Nile floods, used to flood too, uh, but not, not anymore since Abdel Nasser built the dam, the high dam. But uh, there's something about how a river makes a place. And to me, coming from Egypt, as Egypt is the gift of the Nile, and, and Memphis, a city on the Nile, uh, and a town that is made by a river and formed by a river, uh, there's something that, that, that just, many resonances, which, resonances which made me feel uh, a very special bond to, to, to this place, not including, not excluding Elvis Presley. <laughs>
So thank you for that question. I like to hear more ladies ask questions. <laughs> I'm not a lady, but can I go? I reckon I, I can see that very well. <laughs> um, I had a question for you. Um, is this, yeah. I know um, pretty much if anyone read the news, um, during the time of the foundation of the uh, Ground Zero Mosque, you faced a lot of them. Um, in some cases, even discrimination um, for that from other religious groups. I was wondering, yourself being the um, leader of a prominent mosque and um, being Sufi, do you ever feel any um, additional intra-religious conflict, sort of, or do you feel any pressures from, say, Sunni or uh, Shia groups regarding the fact that you are, um, are Sufi yourself? A great question. I, I don't feel. I, I have felt uh, you know, been attacked actually from from all sides, Muslims and non-Muslims. Um, this is why I say that the real battlefront is not between Muslims and non-Muslims. The real battlefront is between the right-thinking, moderate, good ethical people of all faith traditions against the wrong-thinking, extremist, militant, better-than-thou attitude, holier-than-thou attitude people of all faith traditions. And they exist in every faith, including atheists. There are atheists who have this attitude as well. So the real battlefront today is between the moderates against the extremists, because the extremists fuel each other. And, and what we need to do is to figure out how we moderates can get together and, and build coalitions together that can combat the extremists amidst us. So it's not really a Shia, Shia Sunni divide, not really a Muslim, non-Muslim divide. It's an extremist versus moderate divide across all faith traditions. And therefore, we need to combat these people. And, and it's not an easy task because the media loves to cover the extremists because they're the ones who make the news. If I stood up on this podium and said, we have to kill all Christians and Jews, I'd be covered by the media immediately. But when I come and speak about peace and love and harmony, that's not news, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so this is a challenge we have, but I believe that moderates all over the world are the vast majority, uh, that those, who can, those Muslims who wage suicide bombs in our parts of the world are a fraction of a fraction of a percent. The vast majority hates them. They don't like the impact that they are doing upon our societies, upon our economies, upon our communities, upon our sense of security, but they don't know what to do about it. Uh, so what is needed today is, is, is a way by which we can actually eliminate the extremists on all sides because they fuel each other. And that is why we believe to, we, we, I believe we have to actually launch, and I'm actually meeting tomorrow some people to figure out how we can launch such a global movement, coalition and movement, and grow it to become a movement of moderates that can really uh, turn the needle on that. Imam Rauf, thank you for uh, coming to speak with us tonight. Uh, my question is, in the past you've written on uh, the shared values of Americans and the Muslim community and, and what's right with America is what's right with Islam. Uh, my question is, what are some of the primary values that uh, you believe we share? And also a follow-up question, uh, was the, the public outcry regarding the construction of the Islamic Center in New York a few years ago. Did that discourage you or alter your opinion at all on just how similar our values are? Thank you. Um, I just wonder if we should take the question in the order you asked them or the reverse order. The, uh, let, me, let me take this, this, the shared values. In my book, I, and in fact in this book I amplified even more when you look at the founding documents of the United States, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Now, the equality of human beings is something which comes from the Abrahamic faith traditions. Judaism, Christianity, Islam profoundly expounded the idea that all human beings are equal, equal in value, not equal in intelligence or equal in beauty or equal in wealth, or in strength, or we equal in value. Before that, and even in other religions, 
uh, people were not considered equal in value. The king, the pharaoh, the emperor was considered the son of God, semi-divine. You had classes or castes of society, and you couldn't marry outside your caste. You were not equal. And if you had killed, taken the life of the lowest rung in the lowest caste, it wasn't such a major crime as it is taking the life of somebody who was of a much higher uh, caste. So this principle of our founding document, our societal contract, the American social contract, states we believe in a creator. All men are equal, endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, the statement by a creator, and if you read the document, the, the Declaration of Independence, it, it mentions God, I don't know how many times, at least a half a dozen times, providential God, and we, you know, trusting in the providential God, we sign our names, etc. But the notion of a creator, endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, they're inalienable because they're given to us by God not by any human agency, among which are life, liberty, and property. And property was added to pursuit of happiness. As I write in my book, some five, seven centuries before Thomas Jefferson penned those words, Muslim jurists said that all of Islamic law, all of our Sharia, has as its objective one super objective, which was called Maslahat al-Ibad fi dunya wal akhirah the best interests of human beings in this life and in the next. Then they unpacked that into six major objectives, which are called the objectives of the law, maqasid of the sharia, which are the protection and furtherance of life, of religion, of the mind or intellect, of property, of family, and of honor or dignity. So what I say is life is common. Honor or dignity maps very well to the concept of liberty. And what do we do to pursue our happiness? We, sue, we pursue material well-being. We pursue getting married to the ones we love and having a family. We pursue our beliefs the freedom to practice our religion the way we want to, our beliefs the way we want to. We're a free country. I have to do what I believe, right? It was so American. Right? And we pursue our intellectual pursuits, whether it's coming to roads, whether it's going, you know, whether it's solving the New York Times crossword puzzle, which I like to do on Mondays because they're the easy ones. <laughs> this is what we do to pursue our happiness. So we see that the 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 the, ex the existential viewpoint of the American social contract is one that expresses the values of, Islamic, of the Islamic social contract and of, social jur of Islamic jurisprudence on the construct of a society and its obligation to be before God. So this is why I say America is a very sure compliant society in its structure which of course shocks Americans. But many Muslims who come to America say, you know what, America is a very Islamic country. They, I mean, it, they, what do they mean by that? It's a country where we can practice our faith freely, where the values that people have express our values. It's like saying, if a, a, if a state which practices the golden rule is a Christian state, hey, that's fine. But the golden rule is the common rule of all faith traditions. And where else? I mean, Muslims, I used to remember as a child, come Muslims say, man, where do you see a Muslim country where on the currency it says, in God we trust? You know, we say, tawakkalna ala Allah. You know, Muslims say, we trust in God when we start something. And this is a very Arabic, Islamic expression. So many of these fundamental core values which are written, and by the way, Thomas Jefferson read the Quran. He had a copy of the Quran. I don't know how much he studied Islam, but I wouldn't be surprised if he knew some of these things. The first two countries to recognize America were Muslim countries, Oman and Morocco. I guess most of you probably didn't know that, okay? 
The relationships between America and the Muslim world were very, very warm and very positive from the moment of its founding. It wasn't until relatively recently that, that, uh, that America's attitude towards Muslims have changed. But um, up until, you know, the 18th, 19th century, uh, America had a very good relationship with the Muslim world. So these are among the, the, the reasons why I say the values are there. Now, I did my experience of, nine, of the so-called ground zero mosque, etc., controversy, change my attitude? Not in the least. Not in the least, because in fact it even, it even strengthened my conviction in this. Because we knew who were the people who were attacking and why they were doing it. And the marvelous thing was I was supported by many of my rabbi friends, my Christian leader friends. They rallied around me. The mayor of New York supported it. And at that time, I was traveling for a while in the, uh, in the Gulf. I was traveling in Bahrain, Qatar, and the Emirates, and even in Malaysia for a while. And I realized this, 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 this attack against the Ground Zero Mega Mosque, which was a branding designed to arouse hostility towards us, raised America's stock value in the Muslim world. Because the optics of a Jewish mayor of New York City, which is, the, which is demographically the largest Jewish city in the world, supporting a ground zero mega mosque, made Muslims say, what's going, this is like, you know, something different is happening in America. <laughs> you know? They're supported by the president, supported by the Jewish mayor, supported by, you know, and, you know the governor to be elect, or he was running for governor, the attorney general. The, the, the optics in the Muslim world raised, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, in fact, a friend of mine, a very highly placed friend of mine in Malaysia said, you know what's going on in America today? Could not happen in Malaysia without being blood on the pavement. So it has actually um, given me even more hope because the, and the letters that I received, we received over 100,000 emails and letters of support mostly from non-Americans, from every state in the country and from 46 countries in the world, including Israel. People who said, I'm, I will support your, you know, your Cordoba House project. So inshallah, as we say, God willing, we look forward to establishing such a thing. And maybe you can come and uh, ask Bill O'Reilly to come and ham help hammer the nail, because he promised to do that. And I uh, held him, him up to his promise on one of the shows that I went on with him. Thank you. Where are the ladies? Yes. Here. Where are the, yes, there they are. Let's get some ladies. For, I'm, I'm please don't, don't, don't reject the men either. Don't feel rejected. Hi. Um, my question goes, I think, mostly to what you were just talking about. You mentioned people reaching out to you when there was this controversy going on how um, hopefully that helped fight against some of the negative messages you were getting. This has been a pretty recent issue here in Tennessee, specifically in Murfreesboro. Um, our cultural center was burned down, I believe, twice. Uh, pretty, pretty horrific treatment they received. They have just recently broken, uh, uh, finished and opened the doors, which has been wonderful. But of course, my question then becomes, what can we as a community in Tennessee do that, I, I guess, what did the community in Manhattan and around do that helped the most with what you were doing that perhaps we can replicate here in Tennessee? Well, I think the support and the model is very good. I, mean, I remember during a raucous hearing, there was this very lovely Jewish girl, ruddy-faced, came up to me and said, I am Orthodox Jewish and I support because I want to have a swimming pool where women have their own swimming hours. I don't want to have guys looking at me when I'm you know, swimming. <laughs> so I said, oh, wow, interesting idea. <laughs> Because one, one of the questions I was asked, will you have, will you have mixed gender swimming? And I said, well, you know, I hadn't thought, gone so far to think about that in your swimming pool. Uh, the, model, the model that we had of this, you see, really, the model that I had for the Cordoba House is not so much a prayer space. There will be prayer space. I think it's important for us to have prayer space and to honor and have spaces for our faith religions to, 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 to worship in. I think it's very important to worship adjacent to each other together in the same structure is very important and helpful. But what is key to me is that this should be a multi-faith initiative. My vision for the Cordoba House, my Cordoba initiative is a multi-faith initiative. 
I have, I have non-Muslims on my board. Non-Muslims who, who have a, a deep respect for Islam. Some of them worked in, in Muslim countries and, and, and really are very much pained by the tension between what we see America and, and the Muslim world. So if you have a multi-board, a multi-faith board, have multi-faith advisory boards, because that protects the community. And, and, and we are, the whole idea of community is that we should not be balkanized, that we should engage with each other, get to know each other. I mean, God says in the Quran, we created you from one male and one female. We fashioned into, into tribes and nations, so you might get to know each other. So part of our, we might say as Muslims, part of our, our Quranic imperative, or divine imperative, because the Quran for us is God commanding us, is to get to know each other. And getting to know each other is very, very nice. And you know, we have a lot of things to offer. Our food is fantastic. <laughs> you know, I remember conducting a wedding of an Italian, lovely Italian boy who married an Indian, Indian Gujarati girl. Both beautiful, gorgeous young men. Young. When he speaks of his mother-in-law's biryani, his eyes lit up. I mean, you know, the, the things that we do to get to know each other, whether it's enjoying each other's foods, our cultures, getting to know things, is, is, is broadening. You know, you don't lose your culture or religion by learning about another, any more than you lose your language by studying another language. And to be able to converse in more than one language is a great gift. And to be able to understand and communicate in, in, the, in, the, in the vocabulary of a different religion is a great gift. And the writers whom I like, Sean, whom I've read, who to me is just amazing, he can write about Buddhism, he writes about Christianity, and writes about Islam as if he's in, as if based upon a deep internal understanding of each of those traditions. It's like a person who can teach you English and Arabic and French and Turkish and Persian and Mandarin all at one time. What an amazing linguist that person might be or must be. So this is what we need to do today, to, to, to have a garden in which we we, we, we not only have roses, but we have roses and tulips and daisies and, and enjoy both the appearance of, of, uh, of, of everything. And that's what's so great and wonderful about America. We are a multicultural society and, this is, and, and we're a microcosm of the world. And the world actually looks up to us. They may be angry with us, but they're angry with us like a child is angry at its parent. It wants its parent to do better. And I can tell you, the world, by and large, loves America, even as they hate it. But even when they hate it, they hate it because they want us to do the right thing when we are not. And we as Americans have to live up to that. And I think having such spaces and such places and rising up to those challenges and meeting them and developing the formulas that can become Duplicate, formers, successful formers can become duplicate in the rest of the world. That's the kind of leadership that the world needs from us today, and I think we're up to the challenge. Oh, good. She's got it. Yeah, go ahead. Would you speak about, um, about women, about the place of women in uh, Islam? I should invite my wife, Daisy, to speak to you about that. Yeah, she, she's an activist. Um, I think that the, I have a whole chapter on women, actually, in, in my book. And um, I, I believe that, that the, uh, the real thrust of Islam, the teachings of the Prophet, is towards gender equality. And this is something that is one of the unfinished businesses of Muslims in traditional societies. And I think that it is that whatever we see today in some parts, not in all parts of the Muslim world, I must add, of what is deemed to be gender injustice, let me put it that way, uh, is really attributed more to, um, to, to certain cultural norms rather than, um, than religious norms. And like what happened in America, where gender equality and gender rights came about because of the empowerment of women through education, through, uh, through wealth, when women became wealthier, they inherited wealth from their fathers or their husbands, and, they, and, and then they started in lobbying for the right to vote, 
they started establishing women's colleges to educate women. But the same pattern is happening in, the, in much of the Muslim world today. So we see women getting increasingly powerful and influential in, in various parts of the Muslim world. The Muslim world is maybe a couple of generations behind in some countries, although in some other countries, we already have had women presidents and women prime ministers, which America hasn't had yet, although hopefully Hillary Clinton might break that, uh, that particular seal. <laughs> Okay, well, I was just wondering, um, I know that in conversation there's a lot of debate between identifying oneself as Muslim and identifying oneself as American and a Muslim American and all of the overlaps that that implies and means. And I also understand that identification with the Ummah is so important in Islamic theology and that identification with a nation state is a relatively like new idea, but I was just kind of wondering what you thought about this conversation and what it means to identify oneself as one or the other, or both, and I guess, I don't know, if that distinction needs to be there, and if it has merit, and just what you thought about it. Absolutely, this is, what, this is the very topic of my first comments in my lecture today in terms of identity, and my own individual search for identity, knowing who I was. Was I Egyptian, was I Arab, was I Malay, was I English, and was I now becoming American? What was this identity all about? Um, and yes, we, we, we do have layers of identity. And our identities can shift and evolve, and some identities may just fall off, just like roles fall off. Um, you know, I, I identify as a father with my daughters, I identify as a son with my mother and my parents, I identify as a brother with my siblings, I identify as an American when I'm in, in the Muslim world, I identify as a Muslim looked at as being alien when I'm in America. So, you know, I, I play all these roles because as Shakespeare said, life is a stage. And we play various roles. And because America allows dual citizenship, so does Egypt, so I have two passports. But these are different layers of identity which do not, they are peripheral to my fundamental core identity. And my core identity, even, even as a Muslim, once you go beyond, and I think this is what we need to go beyond. We need to go beyond our identities of Muslim, Christian, and Jew, and Hindu, and Buddhist, to look in the worlds of uh, Professor Bilfeld, who was one of the greatest writers, of, uh, brilliant writers, to look at our religions as different ways of being human, as different ways of being godly. It's not about, you see, we, we tend to think of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam as, you know, Jesus Inc., Moses Inc., Muhammad Inc. We have, to think of, we have to think of it all as God Inc. With all of Muhammad, Jesus, and, you know, and, and, and Buddha so as regional managers. Okay. Now, when you reconfigure your identity, and you know that your soul, you know, as you say, you're a child of God, you're a creature of God. We're all God's creatures. That is our most important identity. All the other identities are... Identities in moments of time and space. They come, they have their life, expiration date, they go. Our, our life on earth has an expiration date. But the one thing that does not have an expiration date is that we are drops of the divine breath. And that our destiny is to fulfill that purpose. God created us for a purpose. The Quran says we're created to worship God, to be stewards of God, to use Christian language, stewards of God on earth. But you cannot be a steward of God unless you know what your purpose is about. Now, Rumi has a very lovely story in one of his writings. He talks about a king who sends a, a very dear friend of his as ambassador to a distant land to perform a certain task. And then he comes back, and then the king asks him, Tell me, what have you done? So he tells him about a hundred other things that he has done. But he didn't do the thing that the king asked him to do. He said, well, I asked you to do this. Have you done it? I said, well, look at all these other things that I've done. Well, that's wonderful. But I sent you to do this purpose. Did you do it? And he didn't. The king represents God. 
we are God's ambassadors to earth. Do we know why we are here? That's my identity. That's my primary identity. That's your primary identity. And we have to bond at that level and help each other fulfill that purpose that God had for each one of us. Because when we do that, then we will create the kingdom of heaven on earth. This shining city on the hill. That's what we want to build. Here in Memphis, we can start, we can do it. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. What a pleasure it is. Thank you. I wanted to make really comments, not questions. I have toured Egypt, and from Cairo to Aswan, I have never been treated more hospitably in any country. And I've been in Turkey and up to Istanbul and was again treated most hospitably. But my other comment is I have been reading the mystical books of the Tao Te Ching, the Essential Rumi, the Kabbalah, and the Way of a Pilgrim. And when there are so many similarities, it's so difficult to see why there's so much division. If we could read all of this, we would see that there's so much similarity. We could all live as one under God. Absolutely. Amen. Uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, kind of segueing off of what uh, the last, I guess, set of comments and something you said earlier about us expanding from being a country that sees ourselves coming from a Judeo-Christian heritage to more of an Abrahamic heritage. Do you see, what do you see as the path uh, moving forward for other faiths, such as like um, Hinduism or Buddhism, or even people that don't ascribe to a faith and don't necessarily believe in a divine? It, it, what do you see as like the way in which those can become accepted just as much as, say, the Roman Catholic Church uh, or um, the Jewish community or hopefully the Muslim community soon? Great question. Well, I mean, I think that the... The recognition that all faith traditions, including secular humanism, which to me is the second commandment stripped off the first commandment, you know, don't, don't love God because they don't believe in God, but you know, love your fellow human beings as yourself kind of a thing. Um, I believe that the golden rule, which is the, which is the common principle to all faith traditions, can be a, an anchor and a groundwork and a, 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 a foundation for a kind of global society that bases itself on doing unto others the way you want others to do unto you, which is the essence of the golden rule. And this is what, you know, when Rabbi Hillel was asked to describe the Torah standing on one leg, he said, what you don't like others to do to you, don't do to others. All the rest is commentary. Go and learn, which means, you know, practice, go and practice that. Practice that principle. And if you look at conflict today, it's because people do not practice that principle. Um, when you treat people well, and people treat you well in return, that's the kind of, and people are kind and generous to each other, uh, that's the kind of society we want, we want to have. But conflict is created when people, out of fear or whatever reasons, um, act, commits acts of injustice. So we, who believe in justice, have to have to combat the forces of injustice. And we have to eliminate the Darth Vader forces from our societies. And they exist in all societies. But that's, that's the task ahead, and I think you can certainly include Hinduism and, and uh, even atheism. I mean, look, atheists live in this society. And America was founded as a, as a religious community. But we found space for all faith traditions today. And I think the world, this is the way the world wants to live and is moving towards, in fits and starts, but I think we're moving towards that. 